Hi guys, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, And I'm the lead singer from Spineshank. And coming up today, we're going to talk about John Moxley, who has some pointed words towards madman Vince McMahon, and indeed WWE's scripted promos. Then we're going to give you an update on the AEW TNT Championship and when it's going to be finished. But in between those, because I'm doing a wacky order today, uh, we're going to talk about Alistair Black and why he might be set for a hiatus from WWE TV. Plus some good news regarding Charlotte Flair and the painful aftermath of Dominic Mysterio's assault on Seth Rollins from this week's Monday Night Raw. This is the news. Let's kick things off by talking about John Moxley, Juicy John. He was interviewed on Sirius XM's Busted Open Radio, talked about all kinds of different things, including his time in WWE. And when he was asked about the one thing, or spoke on the one thing that drew him crazier than everything else, the answer was scripted promos. Moxley said that even when he was down in developmental, he heard the term scripted promos being thrown around, but he always figured it was just like a turn of phrase, you know, not like a real thing he'd have to do. But then he made television, he was handed these lines and it just kind of blew his mind. Um, he said that he thought the, these scripts were just going to be like a suggestion, not like an exact thing that you have to say every single word of and he would say to the writers hey i've got some cool ideas we could say this you know we're working this gimmick there's all kinds of options and the writer would just say to him no this is what you're gonna say pal sorry um he then went on and spoke a little bit about vince mcmahon and the pressures of this here's a direct quote uh, i'll tell you what pressure is Pressure is having a two-page script written by a 74-year-old madman that makes no sense, that's going to make you look stupid, and you're on worldwide live TV. you got to memorise every single word and somehow pull it off and not look like a total jackass. That's pressure. And a lot of times I did pull that off, a lot of times I didn't. But I'll never have to be in that situation again, now I just get to be me, it's a nice feeling. Safe to infer from all of that that John Moxley is a lot happier uh, with the increased freedom that he has offered in his promos and his character work and probably pretty much everything else uh, in AEW. So scripted promos are a long-standing bugbear for a lot of people. Off the top of my head, I cannot name a single person who thinks that scripted promos are a good idea that surname isn't McMahon. Uh, but I'm sure <laughs> they are out there somewhere. It's uh, just kind of like this really strange evolution of the creative process, I believe, that came in at the turn of the century when Steph McMahon started assuming more creative control uh, you know the way things were always done in wrestling was you know here's some bullet points but you know express this how you would express it uh, not every single regimented word so it's understandable that an old school guy like John Moxley who worships guys like Terry Funk who has <laughs> been wrestling since 1910 um, <laughs> would, would not be a fan of and not fit in that system end of the day it's nothing new from Moxley we've heard similar things from this before he's not shy of speaking his mind but uh, it's still interesting comments nonetheless Colin Vince man a madman that's always good power and it'll get people annoyed which is probably part of what he wanted so yes exactly i mean we can relate to him this news is thoroughly scripted every single morning <laughs> here it is our wacky banter <laughs> no i mean there's no surprise here like you say um, everyone has sort of said this on their departure from wwe moxley said it himself uh when he was talking about the scripts he was giving around roman's illness uh when he departed uh, and went on Chris Jericho's podcast. One of the best podcasts out there, except for ours, of course. But, yeah, I mean, it's madness, isn't it? Like, I I can almost understand, like you say, when they brought it in at the turn of the decade, uh, turn of the century, millennium, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, they're trying to move away from oh, the Attitude Era. And they're worried that these guys who've been ingrained in cutting these promos and just sort of, if they panic, chucking a bit of F and a Jeff in there to give it a bit of oomph. It might not be able to handle it, but it's 2020 for goodness. I think we don't really give wrestlers enough credit sometimes because, you know, at the end of the day, footballers aren't judged on their post-match interviews, are they? They're judged on their performances on the pitch and it's severely limiting. Like, imagine going out there, like you say, live TV in front, in front of a well, rapidly dwindling audience, but still, in front of a, an audience, in front of a live crowd in particular, and it's not just you know, almost an actor having to remember a script, which is slightly different. 
it's not only having to remember it, it's also if you forget and think, right, well, this is the central point I'm trying to make in this promo, you also then have to process it by saying, well, he won't want me to say this word. I'm not allowed to say this word or this word. Um, and here's a phrase that they want me to work in so they can shove it on a T-shirt and shill that or something. It's madness. I think, you know, with all the stuff WWE has done recently um, over the past, what, year? Let's just say, take that as a sort of a, a, sort of a case study. With all the tweaks they've made of going, right, okay, well, let's do two out of three falls matches so we can get people to watch over the break or, you know, let's book loads of championship matches. If they just said, you know what, from this week, no more scripted promos. We're going to sort the wheat from the chaff. We're just going to say, right, if you can't cut a basic promo, then you probably don't deserve to be in the spot you are. Like, or if they're not capable of doing it or capable of doing it, because I'm sure, you know, not everyone is, you know, the rock MJF levels of, of promo cutting, right? then you just go, okay, well, that's not your forte. We'll either get you a mouthpiece or just not have you cut that many promos. It's the fact that everyone is forced through this bloody conduit of, okay, like you say, here's a two-page script where you have to be cheeky and funny, but also shill this and sell the pay-per-view, but don't say belt or whatever. <laughs> it's just insane. Yeah, it's mental, man. It's all part of a, a, a bigger system, isn't it? Like yesterday, I woke up in such a grump and then I turned raw on. Um, and within like the first 30 seconds, Tom Phillips has said championship opportunity like three <laughs> times. I was ready to just take a day off, <laughs> like it's straight up. It's just uh, the systems are, are, are something else. But unfortunately, I don't think they're ever going to change. If, if in a bubble, right, you took all WWE fans, right, and got them to vote on the 10 best promos from, say, 2010 onwards. Let's just take that as an arbitrary date so you can't include any sort of Attitude Era stuff, right? 2010 to present day, what are the 10 best promos? And then you just said to Vince McMahon, what are your 10 best promos? I guarantee they would be completely different because ours would be, you know, the ones that elicit a sort of a visceral reaction or really make you want to see these two people go at it. And Vince will just be like, oh, them 10, because they remembered all the words and they said yeah. something about poop or yeah. something. The one where uh, Roman Reigns called Seth Rollins, a, what was it, a sniveling stuck-up pile of suffering succotash. So, whatever the hell, that that's Vince's favourite promo ever. Unbelievable. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on to some good news uh, surrounding Charlotte Flair. Uh, Talk Sports and Alex McCarthy reporting that she has had successful surgery to repair complications from a previous breast implant procedure on the 25th of July. We reported on this quite a lot, uh, reporting why she was off TV and what this whole situation was about. I don't really want to delve too into too much into it. It's her own medical issues and that's down to her. But good news to hear, it's successful, it's happened, it's done. No indication is when she's going to return to the ring. She definitely won't be back in time for SummerSlam, although let's be honest, it's wrestling, so never say never, but probably will not be back in time for SummerSlam. Good to hear that she's uh, gone through all that. It's always dangerous, any even minor surgical procedures of course um and yeah i just think it, I, I think fans don't realize it but they really are going to appreciate the time she's had off and have her not be on our screens and then she can have a really impactful return with some bloody planned out storylines hopefully for her i don't know maybe at the royal rumble yeah it's like the thing with charlotte flair is that even if you're not necessarily a fan of her work or her booking i think you have to respect like the graft that she's put in she has not had one single like considerable break since kind of breaking out really she's always been there she's always been on tv sometimes pulling several shows a week um obviously the schedule's a little easier at the moment because there's no house shows or anything like that but you know all the respect in the world for her as an athlete and a worker and someone who puts a lot of dedication time and effort into their craft it's a very difficult demanding job and she's been very near the top of the pile or at the top of the pile for a long time really an unprecedented length of time when you think of like WWE's women's divisions and how quickly people cycle in and out at the top of those. So great for her, very happy to hear that the procedure went well. Looking forward to seeing her back, honestly. I think that'd be a nice surprise maybe in the Royal Rumble or whatever. And I think she'd yeah, get I a good reception. Right. I think, I think you don't want to rush her back too soon. You need to give fans time to want to miss her because I think you ask any respected wrestling journalist or me uh, and they'll tell you how talented she is. But yes, she was kind of forced down her th our throats uh, throughout uh, 2020. So yeah, give her a bit of a break, make fans miss her and then really have her come back with some direction uh, at the start of 2021. I think it's the best thing for everyone. Yeah, get well soon, Charlotte. We shouldn't should say that. 
Couldn't put it better myself uh, because I trip over words a lot. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about other people who might be taking an absence. Uh, I just did it there. Alistair Black uh, might be set for a write-off from WWE television. Got a report here from Shagger Dave. Haven't said that in a while on Wrestling Observer Radio. Uh, says basically that WWE had originally planned to have Seth Rollins and Murphy injure Alistair Black, put him off TV for a while, maybe bring him back, refresh him later down the line. Now, he's pointed out that this may have changed now because I mean every single week it feels like I write up a story for our website that says hey lots of stuff changed last minute for Raw. <laughs> um, they're just you know ripping plans up, putting them back together as people drop in and out of tapings, it's chaos, it's all over the place you can't predict a single thing right now um, but it all, may also still go ahead given how recent TV has gone down so last week Seth Rollins uh, beat Alistair Black and then him they beat him up, they hurt his arm and Gave him a stomp and all this stuff. Uh, and then this week, Alistair Black comes down, his arms all taped and bandaged and slinged up and stuff, and he just gets the crap kicked out of him again. Murphy puts his eyeball on the corner of the ring steps, doesn't pop out, ran right out of ping pong balls uh, to ping. <laughs> but um, good chance he might be set for a little break. It's He's had a weird little run, Alistair Black, lately. It's not been great, I don't think. Um, he was always reported as being a Paul Heyman guy as well, one of Paul's favourites when he was doing creative. He's no longer doing creative. I hope they find something cool for him to do because it just... I don't know, this main roster run has certainly had its moments and there's been some good matches here and there, but for the most part, he doesn't quite feel like he has that aura that he had in NXT where when he came out, you were just like, oh my God, look at this scary goth Dutch tattoo hardcore punk guy. I must watch this. It's a little different on the main roster as it often is. And I would like to see them steps, you know, take the steps required to go back to the way he used to feel. Is that possible? I don't know. We'll find out. Alistair Black potentially going on a little holiday. Yeah, it's been very stop-start with him, hasn't it? It's really disappointing the way they've handled it because I felt in the immediate aftermath of the horror show at Extreme Rules, oh, it's straightforward. You can have Seth versus Alistair Black at SummerSlam just to have, just have him have a normal wrestling match rather than this eye-for-an-eye bollocks because they're two great workers who put on, yeah, a stellar match together and it's a very seemingly straightforward build. Uh, the arm injury would suggest he's going to go away for a while. Sort of losing an eye would uh, would add credence to that. Um, he's one of the few people who I'd say, oh, it'd be a good thing for him to go away for a while because I just want to see more of him. I, I love him. He's so talented. The, the Black Mass has, has no difficulty getting over. Um, but who knows, like you say, if they take a step back with him, take him off TV for a month or two and then bring him back, uh, with direction, not in a bloody cupboard, then who knows? But um, yeah, surreal. You'd think they'd be wanting to make the most of guys like Kim, especially when we're, everyone sat around moaning that they can't create stars. And he he had a blueprint to how to make him a star, as with many guys who come from NXT. And they just went, oh, who wants to pick a fighter? <laughs> oh, what a load of bollocks. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, speaking of I stuff and Seth Rollins, a bit of an update on the aftermath of this week's episode of Monday Night Raw. As you mentioned, Alison Black was there. Uh, we, that was as a result of Dominic trying to take on Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy two on one. And yeah, getting the crap kicked out of him, basically. Of course, eventually Dominic made sort of the save. Alison Black had his eye, got a hurty eye for a bit. Um, and But then... Yeah, Dominic was wailing uh, on Seth Rollins with a, with a kendo stick, and Seth Rollins has posted a photo to his Twitter. I'm not sure if it's on screen now, but regardless, uh, go and check it out, at WWE Rollins, if you can't see it now, of his back following that attack. I've just realised I had a weird dream about being hit with a kendo stick last night. Oh. oh. Yeah, it hurts, even in the dream. Oh. Uh, anyway, Seth Rollins tweeted, Randy at his best, Sasha Asuka title fight, Drew Zigman pulling out all the stops, <laughs> Lashley Ali, Murphy with the W, hash, hashtag WWE Raw with a hell of a show. The only hiccup was that stubborn Mysterio kid. Yeah, sometimes you need to be reminded, Andy, that this wrestling lot bloody hurts. Yeah, I mean, that welt is absolutely brutal. Rather him than me. I never want to do anything related to taking a wrestling bump in my life, so I'll credit him for that. Uh, this, no. I, no. 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 Um, <laughs> Let's talk about the AEW TNT title really quickly. So when this thing was unveiled at uh, Double or Nothing in May, you know, <laughs> the reaction wasn't great. Uh, personally speaking, I thought it looked kind of ugly. Um, the silver, the big TNT, the red lever, 
didn't look great, but it was quickly explained by the announcers that the reason it doesn't look great is because it wasn't finished. Apparently, the uh, company that we're using to make the belt, obviously the ongoing global situation hit them, it was missing a bunch of gold plating. Now, a fan has asked Cody on Twitter, uh, William Soundius, here it says, when will the title design be finished? Cody quote tweeted it last night saying, August the 12th. Uh, Cody also says that he has seen a video of the new plates and it looks very elegant. So finally, after however many months, two months or whatever, we're gonna see the finished TNT title. It's a long time coming. However, man, the belt might not look the best, but the division has been really cool so far. Good little matches, great stuff every week. Elevating mid-carders like Sonny Kiss and Mark Quinn. Uh, having guys like Eddie Kingston come in last week, which I loved, and got Warhorse this week. That's gonna be men metal, is what it's gonna be, and mental. Hey. Um, four Horsemen, but the Metallica version. That's a nice little link with Cody and Tully in the crowd. Shut up, Andrew. Uh, the belt's coming on August 12th. Good, yeah, glad to hear this. Uh, like you say, I think everyone saw it and went, ooh. When, when it got unveiled, but uh, we kind of understand uh, the situation in it all. People saying, oh, well, what about the new United States Championship belt that WE got made? Didn't they get that finished in like January or something? So there's no Something comparisons like that. to be made there. Um, but like you say, regardless of how the belt looks, it has got a hell of a lot of prestige or excitement at least around it, considering all the matches we've had. Uh, we reported yesterday uh, on the WWE questions you want answered, or I called it wrestling questions you want answered, considering this is an AEW one. Um, the fact that JTG has hinted he might challenge for it. You've got Warhorse, as you, as you said. I would love to see Brian Pillman Jr. challenge for it. And then you've got a whole host of names still queuing up in AEW, no doubt. Uh, it's a great championship belt. And once it's finished, really easy to remember when it's finished as well. Just think, all oh, right, it's finished four days after Adam Wilborn's birthday. I, I, I don't want to just, you know, force that home. But if anyone wants to, you know, send me presents or wish me messages, four days before, 8th of August, that's my birthday, and then some belt gets finished or something, Andy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've got to order your events in order of importance. I think you're getting the title shot. That's what I heard. So, <gasps> can you imagine? Please, Cody. I uh, think, right, uh, no, please Tony not. Can. After, after seeing those, after seeing those welts on Seth Rollins' back and seeing Cody wearing that weight belt, I'm good. I'm absolutely fine. You know. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, Tony Khan said something like that in our group chat last night, but I'll double check. <laughs> checks haven't come will... through in a while, actually. On, I will defer to Simon Miller, especially if Lance Archer is going to be knocking about. Smart move. Uh, right, let's move on to your Twitter questions. At what culture WWE, of course, we want to get in touch with us. Uh, start with a question from Matt Ryan, who says, Legend. Is there a match from the history of SummerSlam that you consider a gem that perhaps doesn't get as much attention as the likes of Brett Bulldog or the first TLC? So the one that springs to mind for me is uh, 2016, the, the Seth Rollins Finn Balor Universal title match. Now, this one does get mentioned quite a lot, but the thing about it is it gets mentioned for the injury. Um, mm. It gets mentioned because obviously Balor got hurt on that buckle bomb on the outside, and that's like the only clip we see of that match. It's kind of a shame, really. Now, it's understandable because it's the belt's first match, and you know it kind of ruined Balor's reign after one day when he had to give it up on Raw, but it's a, it's a really great match as well. It's just really tremendous stuff from two of the better wrestlers in the company, and I kind of wish the quality of it got acknowledged a bit more. I understand mm. why it doesn't, but go back and watch it. You'll be very pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good choice, uh, often overlooked as well, because isn't that the same one with the Orton uh, Brock Lesnar main event mm. where he just caved his head in? Yep, yes it is. Yeah, so people probably think of that. Um, in terms of SummerSlam, I, I'm going to have to go with Big Cass versus Big Show with Enzo Amore in a shark cage, brother. <laughs> he oils himself up, Andy, and sneaks through the bars. <laughs> uh, no. And do you know what? If we're going to encourage people to go back and watch a match, it's Finn Balor Central here, Andy, because go back and watch The Fiend versus Finn Balor from last year's SummerSlam because it will remind you why we all fell in love with The Fiend aside from that bollocks neck-snapping spot. It's like, what, seven minutes? And yeah. it's it's literally a, like, horror film murder yeah. is what it is. It's a great squash. I remember Michael Hamflet, we were in the office, I believe. God, I remember when we were in the office, Andy. Uh, Michael Hamflet exploded as part of that, you know, Fiend entrance match. The whole way it's packaged. If you want to remind yourself, presumably ahead of the Fiend challenging for the Universal Championship against, I don't know, is Braun Strowman alive? But regardless, if you want to remind yourself why we all got excited before the Hell in a Cell bollocks, 
that's the match you need to go and watch. But that's yeah, let us know in the comments. We should do we should do another thing about this. Maybe we'll do a uh, what culture wrestling round table talking about forgotten or underrated SummerSlam matches. Uh, second question today comes from It's Siraj. Hope I've got your name there right. Um, who says, what do, you, uh, what do you think would be the right time to pull the trigger on MJF and make him the ultimate heel? Uh, also, if you could just one underrated wrestler in all companies like WWE, NXT, New Japan and AEW, who would it be? Two questions for the price of one there, Andy. Oh uh, my. Let's, start with, let's start with MJF. MJF, um, for me, is still a long-term project. I don't think you need to rush him to the top. I think he's great already. However, I think he's also the, he's very young. He's in his early 20s. He's a guy who benefit from a slow burn. I'm a slow burn fan. I believe in doing things gradually. Some, you know, there's a time and a place for hot shotting someone straight to the top. Diona Perazzo in Impact is a good example of that yes. right now. However, some guys you want to take it easy and gradually build them up. And MJF is still a very young wrestler. So let's see. Let's say a year from now, and he wins the, or longer, and he wins the AEW world title from Kenny Omega. Um, <sighs> underrated Yeah, he needs, to, he needs to be in a building where the booze can rain down, yeah. and maybe even to go really old school, just bits of trash being chucked in the ring as he holds that world championship up. Uh, underrated wrestler, sorry I interrupted you. That's all good, underrated wrestler. Uh, one that comes to mind straight away, and cause, not just because he had a big match the other day, is El Desperado in uh, in New Japan. The guy's an absolute psychopath. He has no uh, thought whatsoever for his own well-being, and he kind of gets overshadowed a little bit in, in New Japan because you've got crazy-ass Hiromu Takahashi over here <laughs> with his broken neck doing bumps on it. Um, but El Desperado is like such an entertaining, fun, wild, out of control junior heavyweight. And I think a lot of people are missing out because there's flashier guys or bigger names in the division. Uh, but Despy's the guy for me. I think he's ridiculously underrated. I want to give a shout out to former WCPW wrestler Gabriel Kidd, who's doing wonderful things over in New Japan. Um, but it also in terms of underrated wrestlers... There's not really many that I can think of to say that people would be like, oh, yeah, he really is, or they really are underrated. So I'm just going to say Rick Bukes because he <laughs> needs to be on TV. Um, we're huge fans of him here at What Culture. And if you're wondering who Rick Bukes is, he's the guy who always pops you in the background when he's in the crowd on uh, Raw and SmackDown. Give him a shot. Give him a shot on NXT because we all remember that entrance he did a while back that got the internet talking and i believe we created we recreated a what we culture. did uh final question today comes from zachary kemp who says since they may hold off on sasha versus bailey what do you think of nikki cross winning the title from bailey would give the option of having bailey looking to sasha as a champ and getting jealous plus then you can have cross versus bliss for the title of course nikki cross challenging bailey on friday for that smackdown women's championship yeah it's an interesting idea it's a good way of creating the parallel between bliss and cross and banks and bailey which they've done really good they've done really well uh, recently on smackdown yeah i'm i'm into it i, I the thing is i kind of really like the 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 alexa bliss nikki cross alliance like it's a bit silly it's a bit wacky um but I think it's like probably the most entertaining that Nikki Cross has been. It's gotten away from the creepy stuff that who wants to play with Nikki and bits and pieces that she was doing before. And it's just a fun little friendship. And you get the impression watching them on TV that their characters and indeed the people behind the characters generally care about each other and stuff. And you don't get that all that often. So I'd be reticent to pull them away straight away um, or so soon. However, I do think it's good storytelling and I think they could do that. Yeah, and I think with the whole people waiting for this, Bailey and Sasha thing. I don't think that's going to happen as soon as we thought anymore. And no. I think they're going to tease it and then go, whoop, swerve. Alexa costa Nikki this week on SmackDown. And then you can have, uh, who is it? Handful of booked Bailey versus Asuka for the SmackDown Women's Championship at uh, SummerSlam. And Sasha versus the other boss, Stephanie McMahon. Mm. Let's move on to today's and finally shout out to the occasional lunatic on Twitter who tweeted us saying, I just created a Twitter account to share my reason for cancelling the WWE Network subscription with you. I'll be watching Simon Miller ups and downs and this is the news like everyone else from now on. I miss hearing uh, Retro J Jules talk about wrestling. Uh, and this is the thing where it says before you cancel your subscription please let us know why you're cancelling and uh, the occasional lunatic has written my reason 
Consistent decline in the quality of WWE product due to blinkered, tone-deaf decision-making by those in charge. Mr. McMahon and Mr. Pritchard are completely, unquestioningly and obstinately out of touch with what fans want, what is safe and acceptable practice, and who is worth pushing. In the event of a major restructuring that sees WWE end up in the hands of someone who can keep their ego in check and make decisions based on factors other than profit and self-gratification, I may return. Wonderful. Absolutely scorched earth from the occasional loot lunatic there Andy that is one of the uh, most eloquent bodyings I have ever seen or heard very good job sir very well done I mean nothing's going to change but you know yeah. nice try yeah. it's worth a go <laughs> uh, let us know your thoughts on that and all of today's news stories in the comment section below don't forget to like share and subscribe uh, and subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts myself and the Dadly Boys previewing the Wednesday Night War a little bit later on today uh, plus you can let us know your thoughts and your Twitter questions on Twitter at What Culture WWE watch there follow both of us you can follow Andy Murray at, at Andy H Murray the H stands for Higginbottom shouts to Danny from Gibraltar he was oh, yeah right. he was he played for the national team good old Danny <laughs> follow me at Adam Wilborn follow us all at What Culture WWE but for my now my thanks to Andy Murray thank you for joining us and we will see you soon <laughs>